Now, I want to find out about you. We're going to close off with the news. We're going to close off the news. But I want to know about you. When I met you this morning, first, when we were, before Mr. Nielsen arrived, you were in a very bad mood. What is it with you? You are permanently in a bad mood. Not really. It's just the impression that I give. It's an impression. It keeps people Stop. away, which when is nice. You, when you wake up in the morning, don't have a glass of lemon juice. Rather have a glass of ice cold water to perk you up. No, it's not. I'm not like Sean Veal. I'm not friendly. <laughs> so you're okay, but you're right. I'm okay. 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 Uh, your family's not here. You should be. <laughs> your family's not here. Where are they? They're in foul water. Going to fetch your daughter. Going to fetch my daughter, yeah. So are you missing the family? Obviously, you're missing your wife. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> fishing, how's that going? Fishing's brilliant. Okay, yeah. fishing's brilliant. So we decided to go to Los Angeles. Okay. That's how we got to LA. So we wind in a, land in LA, and at this point, we have a net worth of $872. Okay, so we land, $872. I'll never forget, that's the number, $872. And we go straight from the airport to an immigration lawyer. Okay. The cab with tip came to 30 bucks. So we get to the immigration lawyer. We had 842, <laughs> right? Before he sees us, there's 400 cash up front for the consult. So I walk in there, my net worth is 442, okay? <laughs> these, are, these are scary times, but these are, these are the defining yeah, moments, I haven't found a place right? to live yet. I mean, to stay for them. Yeah. So cut a long story short, um, he says, the only way you can get legal is if you can work for a company that you worked elsewhere in the world for a meaningful period of time. Because then we can do a special... Visa, so I started working at Ernst & Young again, and now I find myself being an accountant on three continents. I didn't want to be an accountant on one continent, like doing accounting was a, my entry into finance, but yet here I find myself now age 27 or 28, um, working as an accountant now at Ernst & Young in Los Angeles. Um, so I walk into Ernst & Young, they offer me the job right away, I get legal, um, and now I'm working there. So, but here's the, here's the whole thing. This is, the, this is a bit of a crazy story, which is they give you a temporary visa while they're going to apply for your permanent visa. Now, there's two kind of, this visa is called an L1 visa. So, I get a temporary right away. So, now I start working at Ernst & Young with this temporary visa. And then I get the forms to fill out for the permanent visa. Remember, this is just pre-internet. Sure. Okay. The first question is, are you applying for an L1A or an L1B? Now, I don't know the difference. So I called the lawyer, Ernst & Young's lawyers, and they said, no, an L1, you're an L1B. Everybody's an L1B. I said, I'm curious, what's an L1A? He said, no, that's for like the chairman, the CEO, and what have you. I said, but what's the difference? He said, no, they are entitled to get green cards right away. So I went, thank you, put down the phone. I was like, L1A. Screw L1A. this, man. <laughs> L1A, you know? So I start filling out the form. It says, are you L1A A or B? I go, A. And then it says, if you've selected A, skip to page 11. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. that's how I roll. I'm like, skipping this form. Now you get to page 11. It's like, describe your achievements. Like how many thousands of employees you manage, the billions of dollars. Now understand that the only person that I'm senior to at Ernst & Young in Los Angeles is the mailroom dude at this point, right? <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm telling the story here. I write this whole narrative. Like you would have thought that I hung the moon. Like I am the man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I get the form done. Okay, thankfully this is pre-Google. That's what you've got to understand, right? Yeah. There is no fact checking. This is, the world's changed for those people that don't know what the life was like before the internet. This is pre-Google, right? So I get it done, right? And now it says you've got, to, you've got to sign, but then it's also got to be signed by the next most senior person other than yourself, because I'm the chairman, obviously. Okay, I mean, okay, well, I'll just forge his signature, no problem. But then it needs the company stamp. Oh my God, like, like where's... How Here's do I get out the stamp, <laughs> right? So I asked somebody and they said, no, no, the stamp, it gets, it's kept in the senior partner's office and it's used every time they stamp all the tax returns, right? But it's kept in the vault. Like the stamp doesn't yeah. like float around, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm like, what am I going to, how am I going to get hold of the stamp? So I start thinking, I'm going to go to downtown LA. I'm going to hire a safe cracker. I'm going to have somebody break in. Like, I don't know where I'm going, like in my mind, <laughs> where I'm taking this thing. But anyway, the guy says to me, the, the guy sitting next to me, even though I'm chairman, I'm in a cubicle with 500 people. The guy next to me says, no, but next week it's, we do all our tax returns for our clients and every tax return gets stamped. So I come up with an idea. So on tax return day, I come to work at 4 a.m. 
I go around to everybody's desk. I take one of those mailroom trolleys. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I gather everybody's tax returns. And they have a cover that says Ernst & Young. And I get those sticky things that say sign here, sign here. And I put them in there. And then I take my immigration form. And I put it in an Ernst & Young cover as well. And I put it right at the bottom. Okay? And I walk in there to the managing partner's office. Right? Yeah. And he doesn't know who I am. I've only been there for like two weeks, right? Sorry, what is this? Who are you? So I said, I'm Greg Bortz. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I know it's tax return day and apparently you need to sign and stamp all the returns. And my understanding is you get disturbed all day with people knocking on your door. I thought maybe it'd be more efficient if we just did it all at one go and here 440. I said, why, why have we never thought of that? That's well done. So he starts signing and stamping, signing and stamping. And I can see mine at the bottom what of the pile. <laughs> it's but I can, I can tell go that it's boy, different. Go. Yeah, you know, but I can see it's the, they're different. Yeah. Tax return with numbers, immigration form. Yeah. The only thing that's the same is the cover. Yeah. So I started thinking to myself, Greg, what have you done? Like, it's just so <laughs> obvious. Unless yeah. he's suddenly blind, I yeah. mean, he's going to see that there's a difference. And I've got three more to go. We get down, we down like, we've got three left. And I'm like... I'm going to have to say something like, oh, how did that get in there and like yeah, retrieve yeah. the situation? And as that happens, the phone rings. I'll never forget this. It was a guy named Michael Eisner. And if that name's not familiar, he was the CEO of Disney yes. at the time. Yeah. Sure. Disney was Ernst & Young's biggest client. He had it on speakerphone and Michael Eisner started screaming at him. You guys effed up the audit. I'm going to sue you. And I'm sitting in the room. So he doesn't want me to hear. So he quickly picks up the phone and he wants me out of there. So he signs and stamps these things without even paying attention. And I grab them and I run out of there. So then you became CEO okay. of so and now Young. <laughs> I took my form. Instead of sending it back to their lawyers, I took myself down to the immigration building on Wilshire Boulevard in LA. And I submitted my form myself. And 30 days later, I had an L1A. And 90 days later, I had a green card. And I resigned the next day. So now I'm a legal... I committed immigration fraud, but this time I pulled it off because I failed in the UK, but I perfected it by the time I got to LA. What a great story. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a story I'll tell you, Andrew. It, it happened many, many years ago. Uh, Dean Latimer started to train. Yeah. And um, he was battling. So I came back after a long spell and I said I'd help him. And I worked through some of his horses and I thought, Oh my God, this oak's really gonna battle. There's nothing worth it. Anyway, I picked up a gray horse. It was a horse called Agent. And I said to him, this horse is gonna go 2,000 meters. Let's get some money here. <laughs> <laughs> so I get this French Mauritian oak to put bombs on this horse, you see, at like 20 to one. It's got no form. And the race is on. I'm, I'm looking through the field and I'm saying, no, this is a blind school. So I died my bum off to get to ride this horse. And uh, I came to, to the start, actually, maybe one, two kilos overweight, take a saddle off. And the next minute I hear, Mesa's horse is like eight to ten. But its last ten runs, it's had Paul Gadsby riding it. It's got absolutely no form. Yeah. Absolutely no form. It's got no chance but the money's on. Anyway, the gates open up and Mace being the rider he is, he swings in front of me and he says, Dent, give me a chance, give me a chance. I ease off his heels and he gets in and we come into the straight and everything falls away and there's only two horses left, Mace Roberts and me. And I said, not today, boy. The money's <laughs> down. <laughs> so I pulled that whalebone stick and gave this horse six love. And I got up on the line and I beat him. Now I couldn't breathe. The road over there in the summertime, in the summertime, you should get the mos... Is that scratching or handicapping if you need to take it's a take? A, it's the mosquitoes <laughs> and the mickeys. Yeah. And we got, we had the ordinary glasses, not these fancy things that they got now to see through. And as I went through, the mosquito of these mickeys came in my mouth and in my nose. And I couldn't puke because there was nothing to take out. Do you know what I mean? I'd taken off so much weight. And I've anyway, I get back and I think, well, well done now. Dean's got his share of money. I got my share of the money. And we're going to go. As I walk into what is the yeah, goes the, the hooter. I thought, oh, dear God, what happened yet? Can't be me. 
<laughs> it's based at me. Anyway, I walk in the jockey room, can't be, take my bubble from sitting there. Yes, this little bugger, Mace, walks up to me. He says, uh, Den, you got any money? You know, Mace, still today <laughs> won't carry no money. <laughs> That's why he's got the first pound he's ever had. He says, Den, you got, that time was 50 rand. He says, you got 50 rand for me. I'm not thinking. Yeah. I said, yo, look in my pants. Yeah, he takes the 50 rand. <laughs> and, and he goes into, and he logs objection against me. <laughs> <laughs> money. I walked inside, yo, but he, I said, I said to him, when Jock Sprout called me, I said, what are you talking about? He crossed me. You understand? He crossed me. Anyway, naturally, thank God, it stood. Because Mace was a schemer. And they went for big money. They were, And anyway, I, I phoned my oak. And I left it, and I left it. And about 40 years or so later, I was going through my scrapbooks. And it was Duff's turf card. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. And I got the Duff's turf card, and I was looking there, and I found this race. And I thought, you know what? I got to take this little bastard to, <laughs> to the track. And I went to the track, and I said, Mace, do you remember this? And you know him? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I threw the Duff's turf card, which I gave to him. I said, now 45 years ago, or even more. Can I have my 50 Rand back? With interest. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know he never gave me my 50 rand back? He's a bastard. He's, he kept every cent. I don't think he ever carried money on him. I don't think he ever needed to. Everybody gave him everything for nothing. <laughs> no, he was he was Jock Sproul's little blue-eyed boy, wasn't he? I don't even want to go there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't even want to go there, Andrew. You know what? Yeah. If Jock Sproul could have him as his son, it would have yeah. been his son. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before we talk racing, you must have had one or two funny moments or embarrassing stories, and you know, it's just, uh, you've maybe gone for a goal that you can't, you know, you can't lose, you can't miss, and you miss, or you, you miss, or you yeah, one or two funny little stories you can share with us. Yeah, there's, <laughs> I, I must talk about my, my uh, and, and I hope that I can just cut it down to the finer, short, abbreviated <laughs> patch when I first joined Amazulu, where, where uh, you know, being a very cultural. Muti, Muti based team, you know, and now I'm here, there's some Lungu that's <laughs> coming to, to this team and you have to embrace the culture of the club. If you want to be successful, no matter where you go, if you're not intense in your culture of that club, of that, of, 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 the, of whoever it is, if it's Zulu, Sutu, whatever, you have to embrace the culture and I remember my first game we played Acadia Shepherds uh, at uh, at um, uh, where the Sharks play the rugby at uh, um, King's Park King's Park because uh, yeah. that was our home ground there not the soccer stadium okay. Amazulu we played out at King's Park and shared the training grounds behind there and we were playing Amazulu now Amazulu when, when Durban City used to come camp for a home game it was basically you'd arrive at the day of the match, have your pre-match meal and play the match and then go have a night and, and go home, you know. Whereas uh, Amazulu used to camp and, you, and they camped at the Athlone Stadium because they used to have to take their players out of the, the lo location, uh, out of wherever they lived because it wasn't pleasant for them to, to stay there, sure. you know. We're talking about apartheid days. And um, so that they can have a good night's sleep and a good night's rest and then play the match. So now we come to Athlone Stadium, we come and have a, a Friday night before the Saturday match. I'm having a meal, we have our meal, we go to our rooms. And now, there, as I said, there was a couple of Mlungus, Jimmy Ormshaw, Mervyn Hoflesh and them, and they were, we were rooming. And we got, a, and then half past 10, there's, there's a knock on the door. Ah, come down, there's, a, there's a, like a type of meeting, you know? So I come down, uh, come down the cold now, um, uh, Athlone Hotel, which is now called Riverside. Uh, Riverside, okay. Riverside, yes. these long corridors, you know. So I come down the corridor, I knock on the door, and I open the door, whew, there's just smoke. There's just smoke. And, okay, fine, okay, we go inside, and there's um, uh, Sungoma on the floor. He's got his burner, Bunsen burner, and he's got his uh, horse manure that's compact, that's how they do it, and he's burning it. And now he says, okay, come, come in, come get under the, the, the blanket, the blanket yeah. yeah, the blanket, come there, come and, you know, come in the blanket. So now, now we are, now, yeah, 
obviously smoke's not good for a sportsman, but you engage in it, you know, yes. you engage in it. I'm lifting up here to get, get a bit of fresh air <laughs> and I'm coming down again. And you engage in it and say, okay, fine, that's great. And we, we, we're having it, the blankets are over us. We come out, he says, great. So he says, okay, thanks. Now we're just in a shorts and slops and t-shirt at that stage. So he says, okay, we think, okay, thanks, thanks, God. He says, no, no, you're not finished. <laughs> He says, you go into the, into the bathroom, go into the bathroom and you just wipe yourself down and you wash yourself down with, have, a, have a bath. Now there's a bath and obviously the shower head and you've got that, the, the, uh, the shower curtain, you know. So we pull it back, sheesh, there's just mud, sticks, leaves, everything in this bath. And he's like, you better wash yourself. So anyway, we, we engage again because, you know, don't be engaged in the culture. We get there, we're both standing, in, standing naked in the bath and he's throwing mud at me and now we get engaging now, a bit of fun in it. Putting the fun, we're wiping each other down with the mud and engaging all over our bodies with the mud and that. And he, and he comes in and he says, ah, oh, great. He says, but you don't wash off until the morning, eh? <laughs> so he says, oh, okay, well case whatever so now we, we says we walk out the, the down the corridor you know we put our shorts back on but now we're trying to get back to the room and next minute oh we're getting itchy we, we, we bloody got itch all over our bodies you know so i don't know what was in that mud but now we're scratching each other's back as we're running <laughs> down the corridor <laughs> and that was that was our first moody sort of orientation thing and and as it turned out the next day, as I said, we never, Amazulia had never beaten Acadia Shepherds home or away. Never ever beaten Acadia Shepherds home or away. We play and we, we won all down after seven minutes. Six. Nothing. Jeez, it's going to be a long day. But managed, we get in half time. And then just after half time, I managed to get a pass through to Julius Chua. Uh, and, and he scores and it's 1 1. Now we, it's going. Now we're on top of them now. Gets to the last seven minutes. There's a corner kick for us. I go for the corner and I, I head out and I get the winner on my debut. For Amazulu. I score the winner. And then I say, Jeez, I'm going to have that Muti every week. <laughs> 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 and uh, Serena, your parents, uh, okay, so they they at home on their own then because, or was your brother with them? No, I've actually got, uh, I've got two brothers, okay. older brothers, so my older brother actually lives with my parents for okay. the time being, so yeah, they're not alone. Okay, okay, so there's mm-hmm. three, three, they've got uh, three boys? Yes, three, three boys. boys. Okay, three boys. Okay, and uh, thank you, three boys, uh, and, and so your mom, she would have had four boys in her life then, because she's got <laughs> a husband and three boys. Uh, it's like me, the opposite, I've got only girls, three girls. You've at least got a mixture. Yeah, well, good stallion. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's just find this horse's name quickly. And then I'm going to uh, ask you to pronounce it for me. Oh, you might get it. You might get it. Number six. Put your glasses on. You're going to need your glasses on. I'm, I'm sure you'll get it. You'll get it. No, I can't get that one. Okay, listen. Okay, do you want to see, have a look? Number six. No, jeez. No. Okay. No. Yeah, when I tell you what it is, because only the no, call no, gets to explain it to me. But Sipo is riding it, so it's fine. Huh? This is how no, you pronounce no. it. Sipo. Race two, number six. Are you listening? I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> Speak I wrote, up, I wrote it's taking a bit of time. Pass me that. Pass me that. No. Pass me that. Need no, glasses. No, 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 the computer form in there. I've got it. I know exactly, but I need, I've, written, I've broken it up. <laughs> <laughs> I've broken that. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. And you'll know when you you might not know. Here it is. You see, you're on the front, isn't that you? Yes. There we go. Look at that. That must be an omen. Serena Mudley being interviewed. Front page of the of the computer. Form. The horse's name is. Is you is, or is you ain't. Okay, we think of the Zulu name, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but but, yeah, but uh, j- jokes aside, Carl Hewitt told me that there's a song called that, an old song from the 1960s. Is you, is you is or is you ain't? That's the name of the horse. Race two, okay. number six. Is you is or is you ain't? I ain't. No. How's that for a tongue twister? Oh. Have you heard? I haven't heard of that song. No, no. Anyway, Carl Hudson told me the whole story. Is you is or is you ain't? I had to break it up. It took me about half an hour, don't worry. (laughs) And in fact, 
I owe Henny Peterson a great debt of gratitude because I only got the job in Cape Town as a commentator because Henny Peterson moved from the Cape to join Port Natal Radio in Durban because Henny Peterson was the commentator, the Afrikaans commentator was Sandy Bickett at the time. So they actually only advertised for an Af- Afrikaans commentator and I, I was audacious enough, even though Afrikaans was very much my second language, to apply and get the position. Not immediately, they tried one or two other guys. And then Henny Peterson, of course, came up here and was calling races and he was a great guy. And we'll never forget, of course, his call at Scottsville when he said, Andy Vanner het gewen. He completely uh, forgot who the horse was. And uh, Andy Vanner het gewen. Andy Vanner het gewen. <laughs> <laughs> and that one uh, story you were telling us about... Uh, uh, you commentated past the post. Is yeah, well, it was remembered. Like, we didn't have TV in those days. It was radio. Yeah. It was the slowest uh, summer cup <laughs> in the history of the race. <laughs> <laughs> it went on for an extra 200 meters. Now, um, you're going to probably clap me after this podcast because <laughs> I was walking around the rings this morning and somebody, and I, I'll t- you might even know who, said, I must interview you, and I mu- which they saw the advert. They said, can you confirm or squash the rumor whether you're wanting to be taking out a trainer's license. I'd love to take out a trainer's license. (laughs) 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 I I think history is against me in that vets don't make good trainers. (laughs) 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 Because uh, it was one uh, uh, Stuart Ferry that was asking this question, and he said, I should blame Lorenzo Karim. I said, no, 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 boys. Uh, They were all obviously good friends of yours pulling your leg. I think that they are just spreading rumors. uh, I've always been an (laughs) athlete and I've been a cyclist all my life. And I do love to follow heart rates and recoveries. And so I've got a tendency to want some of my horses to jump on Pete Musket's treadmill so I can (laughs) see some parameters. (laughs) And that's where I think it comes from. And that's tuning you up. uh, When I'm saying to Stewie, he said, can Luna Cam not go on a treadmill so I can just see what he does because (laughs) I like to see numbers. They say, are you training it now or aren't you? So, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, as I say, I I tend to get uh, a bit too involved and I I get uh, get red carded now and again and I have to (laughs) get back in my box. But it's never never with any malice. because you're so you're passionate and you love it. Okay, I really yeah. love numbers and okay. um, and watch and how horses and, and those, yeah. okay, But he yeah. rides bicycles. Yeah. And Sean, I'm in the clocks and <laughs> the clocks and mode there with bicycle and <laughs> cyclists. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and Sean Veal was also part of the chirping colony. It was Sean and Stewie, <laughs> and uh, they said I must blame Lorenzo. But all a good bunch of guys and lovely to have some fun. Well, just remind Stu to send Luna Camp to the treadmill tomorrow then. <laughs> <laughs> and Rocket Man, I mean, what was he like to train? We, we, we touched, sorry, we, we touched on, on, on his little injury, well, his injury that he had, but how was he to train? He was the easiest horse in the world to train. Um, he was actually a mug's horse to train, you know. <laughs> um, funny enough, when he had his first, first canter around, um, I actually phoned Ricky, I said, I haven't seen a horse with an action like this in a long, long time. Uh, Ricky was up at the yard still those days on the new working horses on the treadmill. And um, he said, yes. I said, yeah, you I said, tomorrow morning come down just and funny enough Robbie got off him. Rob, Robbie rode him from day one. Um, and Robbie got off, he said, Pat, this horse just gives you he does it so freely. And I said, funny enough, I just phoned uh, Ricardo and I said to him. And um, he said, he flows. And then obviously started working him. I gave him his first gallop with a horse that just won a two, uh, two, two out of two. Um, he annihilated him. I thought, you. Then worked him with a, a five time winner called Blade Lager. Uh, he'd won five. He annihilated him. <laughs> and I thought, my third, my third gallop was a horse called British Navy, who really won nine. Uh, it was very, 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 very good horse. And I galloped him with him. He was a thousand meter specialist. And Robbie was sitting with a double handful. Within, within 100 meters, he just went, and it was like four lengths. Sure. And I thought, no, this, this is impossible. <laughs> and the more I told people about him, 
trainers and that I met and from Australia, and I'm saying, oh, this Viscount, everybody see me, they, they're rubbish. I got one that can run. Listen, you can have it. You can have it. <laughs> and he started fifty-four dollars the first time he ever ran. Jeez. Even after all those gallops, I never punted him. Fred wasn't a punter. Um, Mark was a bit of punter. A uh, 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 punter, Mark Young. He had, he listened. He had a couple of ran. And um, funny enough, he, he bumped us of John Mars. That John Mar had rated the best horse he ever trained in Singapore first time out and he told his owner he was one of the biggest owners who is the biggest owner in Singapore at the moment he said you can have the biggest bet ever on the source sure. of his and he bumped rocket man Jeez. so unfortunately he ran second but uh, yeah. Robbie and then Robbie came back I must be honest Robbie said to me Pat he said I was in third I was in third again yeah. I uh, sent an email out that we have a meeting today and you have arrived in shorts and, and no alamites. Are you going to a boardroom meeting today dressed like that because you can, because you're re semi-retired? Well, I'm retired. They can't fire me. so. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Andrew Harrison here in his shorts, no alamites. Andrew, are you well? And uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. yeah, good. Absolutely. You never change. That's how you are. Shorts, you'd fit in well at he Hollywood head office because it's shorts only. Is that right? Only if you're the boss. <laughs> Only if you're the boss. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah but I don't wear shoes though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 